Joining us on the conversation today, we have a very well-known and popular blue tuber. He's been in the movie collecting and YouTube game for a minute and um, is a dear gentleman. And I'm very happy to have him joining me today. We have Tony from Basement Blues. How's yeah. it going today, sir? I'm good, KB. I really appreciate you asking me to be a part of the show. I've really enjoyed what I've seen so far, so I'm very happy to be here. I appreciate you taking me up on the offer because, um, well, we'll we'll talk about that in the questions, but um, it's an honor to have you on my channel. That's all I'll say from my perspective. So uh, it's spooky season, so we're going to talk a lot about some horror movies, but uh, we're going to start off with a couple of questions first. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. All right. So I normally like to start with a non-movie question to get things going, and... I had James from 20th and 21st movies on. Mm -hmm. I know he's uh, he doesn't live too far from you. Right. And when I when I had him on, I asked him about food because when I come down there, that's one of the things I like to do is hit a couple of places. Uh, have you ever been to Papacito's Cantina? I have not. No, no, I haven't. Mm. You know, I really don't. Um, I'm a real picky eater. You know, I always have been since I was a kid. So my palate is very bland. Um, I eat just the basic things, hamburgers, pizza, chicken, steak, potatoes, just the basic stuff. I don't really go to fancy restaurants. We keep it pretty simple here at my house. Hey, that's that's cool, too. You know, uh, I'm I'm a homebody. I, I like home cooking myself. But, mm -hmm. you know. It, it it definitely it, it doesn't surprise the palate. I'll just leave it like that. Right. <laughs> but I also live in Kansas City, so I like mm -hmm. to go out for you know some good food here too. Some good barbecue. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I have to say, man, you you are beloved. Oh. Um, you've been the most mentioned and the most requested person since I've been doing these conversations wow. and for good reason, for yeah. good reason, I have to say, um, how do you feel about the love you get into blue tuber and the movie collecting community? Um, I, I really, I, I like it. You know, I don't really have much in my life outside of just being at home, going to work, going to church and being here with my collection. You know, I have a really nice family, family members that love me. But it has been really good to see a community come together that have the same interests as I do. Because, you know, outside of this community, there's really not many people you can talk to. You know, you can talk to people at work about what you've seen and what you're watching, but they don't understand all of this. And so it's mm -hmm. nice having a community that, that understands that. And I really do appreciate it. And I love everybody out in the community also. And and we love you, man. We love you for your movie knowledge and you know, we love seeing when you do your unboxings and your slip slip cover Saturdays and all the, the good segments that you have on your channel. Right. I but with that in mind, I, I also have to say you are highly envied. You know, <laughs> people try to make yeah. little jokes and, you know, little stabs at you buying everything. It's, it's, it's so a, dumb to it me. It took a long time to get to the point to where I could do that kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. you know raising a family, um, having all the responsibilities of having a young family. So over the years, over the past 40 years, 30, 40 years, uh, you know, as far as me collecting, I didn't get to use I didn't use to get to buy all the things that I wanted to buy. So when I got to the point to where I could, then I just kind of went crazy with it. Yeah. But the whole thing is, like anything else, like if someone's successful in something, mm -hmm. people see the success. They don't see the journey that it took to get there or the sacrifices made wow. to get there. Yeah, so, you know, also being a family man myself, I understand that, you know, I, I used to be a big sneaker collector. Not to have, just to have, but, you know, I, I liked my... My, my sneakers and my Air Jordans and all that. Right. But when you got mouths to feed, you know, they come first. They yeah. become your priority. Yeah. So there's, there's people don't time, see that. There's been times in the past where I had to sell, I had to sell some of my collection, you know, because my family came first. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so when I got to the point where I didn't have to do that any longer, I, I wanted to buy the things back that I lost. 
And so that's kind of where the outrageousness went to. <laughs> but I always say, like, when I hear, because I, it's like I almost take it personal myself because mm -hmm. it's like you, you're saying your little jokes and your jabs, but you know if you could, you would. Yeah. So how do you feel about, I call it passive jealousy, about your collection? How do you feel about it? Yeah, you know, it it, it gets upsetting, you know, I don't I don't collect to be a show off. You know, I think a lot of people think that I'm buying just to show off what that I can buy it. But I buy it because I love it. Um, it's fun to collect. It's fun to get the different editions. So it, it does kind of hurt sometimes when you get those comments about, you know, don't you know that there's things going on in the world? You shouldn't be spending all your money on this. You shouldn't be spending your money on that. But, you know, what else do I spend my money on? This is pretty much what it is. You know, pay my debts, pay my bills, pay the house payment, car payments, all the normal stuff. And this is just this is just what's left over. I hear you. And the whole thing is you're you're not going into debt to have your collection. Exactly. You're, you're, you're doing what you can within your means. Exactly. And to me, that's being responsible. Right. And, and plus, plus it's a it's years of collecting it's not like it just happened overnight so you know you see this and you think oh, i spend a lot of money every month which which i do spend excessively each month it seems it gets worse and worse because there's so many good things coming out but it's not like we're doing without the cause of that right and you know truth be told I, I just got mm -hmm. a package from grindhouse and oh, yeah. there's nothing better than to come home and see something in your in your mailbox or something on the table it's that just arrived not christmas every day right mm -hmm. it's like a, a little boost of serotonin that yes. just goes yeah. through your body <laughs> oh man so like i said it's spooky season so what i've done is i've changed my five takes that i normally do at the end of conversations mm -hmm. and i've kind of made them around the horror theme so with that, are you ready to do the five spooky season takes? Oh, yeah, definitely ready. All right. So, number one, name the horror movie that made you fall in love with the genre. Um, I, I would say, which is an odd choice, but the Amityville Horror was one of the first films that I saw as a kid. And I just remember loving that movie so much. Um, I guess just because of the feeling that it gave you to to see something like that as a kid. Um, you know, I, I went out and I borrowed the the book from the library. I read the book. I did a book report on it. I was just so fascinated about about the um the haunted house, um, about that family, it being based on a true story. And that's really what got me into really loving horror as much as I do. It's amazing when you think about that as a movie to find out that it's based on a true story yes. and growing up in new york i i know mm -hmm. exactly where that house was mm -hmm. it's not there anymore but i had um like roommates in college i had two roommates in college one lived near where the amityville house was mm -hmm. and my other one lived in glen cove new york and mm -hmm. that's where the outside of wayne manor the outside that's where they filmed that outside so wow. he's driven me past that that mansion before so it's kind of cool to see like these two things oh, yeah. um from our tv and movie history up close yeah that is really cool but yeah there was something about that that movie and how it really it captured um a lot of people with not only the story but the reality of it too mm -hmm. I, I love true crime and anything based on true crime has always been fascinating. And so when I saw, and of course, as a kid, I didn't know about all of, all of the true crime type stuff, but, but learning it later really made me more fascinated with it. But, but the film itself was just amazing. I, I loved the priest, the possession, um, the flies everywhere, just all, all of that. The, the house was scary itself with the way the windows were um mm -hmm. it's all that stuff it's just really creepy i had ryan from the disconnected uh mm -hmm. we had a 
a conversation over the weekend and I asked him, what is it about the horror genre that gets you? So I'll extend that same question to you. You know, it's always fun to have a laugh and to be excited and happy about something, but also it's a different feeling to be terrified and scared, especially when it's something that could be a reality. Um, You know, if you go outside and it's pitch dark and you can't see what's around you, it's always unnerving, not knowing what you're going to bump into. And I think with horror films, just the excitement of the anticipation of that something's going to happen. You know, there's going to be that jump scare. There's going to be that really gruesome looking image. Um, To me, that's always been exciting to get your heart pumping. And I think that's really what does it for me is just the excitement of it. So with that in mind, let's move on to number two and we'll kind of land a plane here for a while and hang out. But name five of your favorite horror films. These I selected these more because you don't hear very much about some of these films. Um, so the first one is, of course, Marrowbone. Now, this right here is a film that I never even knew about. Um, and being on YouTube, um, being on Instagram, you get a lot of good recommendations. And this is something that somebody had recommended for me. And so I checked this movie out. It had everything that I like in a good scary movie it wasn't necessarily what you would call terrifying and scary but it is one of those films that is more of like a um has a surprise it has a surprise throughout the movie has a great cast a young cast um i took some notes i took some notes that i wanted to um talk about this particular film yeah go for it this film um took place in like 1969 and that's the year that I was born and it was about this young family um, whose mother and the family moved to this location um, because of um, running away from their troubled past and they um, the mother passed away while they as they had moved and so this um, young family this brother and his siblings had to kind of keep it a secret that they were there by themselves living in this old house. And the story takes place probably within a few months of them, of this happening. And there's just a really nice surprise throughout the film. Um, It's got some really good um, co-stars in the movie. Now the main star is the brother who is the same young man that played the soldier in the movie 1917, which I really Mm -hmm. haven't seen him in very many things, but it was really good to see him. I I think his name is George McKay. Um, It's got Mia Goth in it. Mia Goth's really hot right now as far as being out in a lot of films. Um, And it's got um, Anna Taylor-Joy in this also. So it's just a really good story. The um, cinematography is beautiful. The eeriness of this old house um, is really nice. So definitely a great recommendation for me. If you've never seen Marrowbone, that's one that I would highly recommend. Yeah, this was a new watch for me. And the the two things that you just mentioned, the cinematography and especially the young cast, I mean, to, to look at a movie from, you know, five years ago and to see where the four young stars are today, like you mentioned, George McKay doing 1917, mm-hmm. Anya Taylor Joy, and you know everything from Queen's Gambit to oh, Last yes. Night in Soho. Mia Goth is like the it girl for right. horror movies right now. Yep. And the other brother was um, Jonathan on Stranger Things. If you ever watched that, oh yeah, that's and, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was really good to see like their talent, mm-hmm. you know, playing this young family. And I I really didn't know what, you know, sometimes you, you try to turn your brain off and watch a movie, but you're also trying to, like, figure it out like a Scooby-Doo episode or something. And I'm trying to see where is this movie going? What What's the mystery and everything? And I couldn't figure it out. Yeah. And when we got to the end and the mystery was revealed, Just it was... Alone. Yeah, it was yeah. it was mind blowing, but it was also satisfying. It was yes, and, and, and not even 
So it was very satisfying at the end, but even the journey to get to the end was satisfying because so much was going on in this house. Of course, the ending explains what was going on, but to me, I, I just love a story that has something like that, an element in that. There's been other ones similar to that. I'm not going to name any of the other films that I think are similar to this because I don't want to spoil anything, but mm-hmm. definitely a great movie to see that I had never even heard of. Never remember seeing that one in the theater being, you know, out and about. I never, never even heard of it. Yeah, I think if it was in the theater, it was like it came by quick and it left yeah. just as quickly. But I'm I'm glad when you suggested this one and check it out because it was really, really well done. Yeah. Where do you see the horror element coming into it without, of course, giving anything away too much? Mm-hmm. Um, Just... I guess just the eeriness of it, you know, anything with an old house in it and Mm -hmm. a possible haunting in the house is always, you know, very eerie to me. Um, Just I I love a good story as far as especially with kids involved. You know, you think about kids and horror. That's always kind of a scary element also. Yeah, definitely. Good choice. Good choice. Thank you. What's your second one? Second one, I went to an old classic, and that is Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. So I am a big fan of old Hollywood films. Um, I think it's because growing up, my mom used to always watch the old Doris Day films, Rock Hudson, um, Joan Crawford, Betty Davis. And so when you get these two people together in this classic horror film, this is a digibook packaging that I got a long time ago. I never did open this up. Because I've got the I've got a Blu-ray of this, but I just love the digi books that they used to do. But anyway, it's just a really good story about two sisters. One was a famous child actor, and then their sister was um, I don't know, there's like a jealousy between both of them. And something happens early on in their life to where one is um injured and has to be put in a wheelchair, and so the other sister has to take care of her. And just the, um, I wouldn't even call it civil rivalry because it's a lot worse than that, but just the Mm -hmm. hatred, the hatred between Betty Davis and Joan Crawford in this film. And just to know the backstory of the two actresses and what was going on in their lives in real life, how they really did not get along whatsoever, um, kind of is an afterthought after watching this film. This was a very difficult film to get made because of their rivalry in real life. And it really just enhances the story to me. But it's just a really good story. Um, black and white, of course. Um, they lived in an old house, an old rundown house that they couldn't keep up. And just the eeriness of it. I, I don't know. It was just a great film. Yeah, it definitely was. Um, that's one of those films. Same thing like you. I, I grew up watching a lot of those uh, classic Hollywood films. And that that was one that they they almost used to present it like a pure horror movie and mm. wouldn't like show it in the day in too much until mm-hmm. like TCM came along or whatever. Right. But like you had to stay up and watch it late night if you wanted to see it like on TV or whatever. Yeah. And now with uh, the TV series Feud, yes. that um, Betty and Joan Did that you had it? them... Oh yeah, I did that too. Was, I loved every bit of it. It's a great accompanying piece to the movie mm-hmm. because you they did such a great job just showing, just like you said it, the hatred between mm-hmm. them, and that translated so well on screen into it the did. movie. Yeah, it was perfect. Going back, I got the Warner Archive when it came out, mm-hmm. that Blu-ray, and then to go back and watch it again was just like oh yeah their their performances you can't pick out one versus the other and say right. you know betty was better than joan or joan was better than right. betty but just oh that, yeah. that movie is something when i saw you pick that i was like <laughs> not your typical pick when it comes to no. a horror movie no it's so, one of my favorites same question again how would you relate the horror in that I don't know. Do you know with them, it was more of the isolation. You know, to me, they were always isolated together, almost like they were homebound. And just mm-hmm. the way that your mind can 
play tricks on you and you can start thinking that one's after you want to kill you and vice versa. Just that um, isolation, I think, is where the horror comes in for this one. And just the hatred, the deep-seated hatred that they had. Um, not necessarily both of them had, but one of them had against the other. Just the jealousy. You know, I can actually see something like that happening in real life. To, um, anyways, I, to me, that's where the horror horror plays in. This this is something that could truly happen. Yeah, and and the unknown, like not knowing what was going to come next, or what that sister was possible uh, or capable of doing. Mm-hmm. That that really uh, comes through so well in that movie. Yeah. Great choice. Good. Great choice. Uh, number three. What's your third one? Okay, number three is a pretty recent horror film, and it is The Autopsy of Jane Doe. Um, mm-hmm. This is another one that I've had in the collection for a long time, but I never actually opened it up to watch it. And someone had recommended that I check this one out. So I finally watched it um, and was just very pleasantly surprised. This is another one that I had no idea. You know, of course, I knew there's going to be an autopsy involved. I thought it was going to be more of um, um, a whodunit type thing. You know, who's the one that killed Jane Doe? But that wasn't really what it was at all. It's really more of how did Jane Doe die? You know, what caused her death? And so there's this father and the son um, who both work at a, their corners. They both work in a funeral home. They actually live at this funeral home, I do believe. And they had to do this autopsy on this um, Jane Doe, someone that they didn't know who, who it was, and try to figure out what killed her. And during the whole, it's almost like there was two halves to the movie. The first half was more of, just the um, the family dynamic with the father and the son and this body and them trying to figure out what happened to her. And then the second half is more of the supernatural. So as they're, as they're digging through trying to figure out what happened to Jane Doe and doing the autopsy, a lot of strange things start happening at this funeral home with the power going out. Um, anyways, it was just really good. It's very eerie more of a supernatural type film. Mm-hmm. I don't want to spoil anything, but definitely a film that you would probably want to get into and, and check out. Like I said, it's like two movies in one. The first half was really good and eerie. The second half was more supernatural and the darkness and all that good stuff. Yeah. This was another one that I had not seen before, but you know, it was always on the yeah watch list. Right. So. I moved it up to the top and I, mm-hmm. I put it on and yeah, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, especially when it, it took like, I don't know what word to use a religious term. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I started putting things together. This one, I kind of figured out before it ended, but I was still happy to see the reason why. Um, it, it was a very surprising movie and I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. The performances. Brian Cox, uh, oh, for yeah. anyone who watches Succession, plays yeah. the father of the father and son uh, duo that yeah. Tony mentioned. Great actor. Great the, actor. The thing about the actress that played Jane Doe, do you know that actress was there the whole time? She, it was no model. There was no um, special effects or anything. It was that actress laying on that table the whole time. So just the fact that she could lay still like that as a dead body was amazing to me. I didn't learn that wow. after I watched it, but um, she was, she was there the whole time for that performance. Wow. That's amazing yeah. because <laughs> for a dead body, she played right. a really good part. <laughs> right. Especially being, wow. nude, especially being nude the whole time too. It'd be kind of awkward. Um, but the horror element for this particular, for this particular film, there's really two different elements the first element was more of just this beautiful looking old funeral home um, and really not m- mostly just the funeral home part because you didn't really get to see the funeral home. You saw more of the coroner area where they do the autopsies, just the eeriness of the way that looks down in their basement. And then the second half with just the darkness, um, the supernatural, not knowing what's lurking in the darkness, the sounds that they hear in the basement. 
Um, there was an elevator. Lots of different things happened, and to me, that was really creepy. I just I loved every bit of it. Yeah, I I really enjoyed it too. And like I said, Brian Cox kind of anchored all oh, yeah. the other performances because I mean he's in most of the scenes here, mm. um, minus a few and. He's one of those actors where other actors perform better off of him. Right. Mm-hmm. So that, that really showed through in this movie. Yeah. What's your next one? Okay, my next one is another modern horror film that has a really nice franchise, and that is Insidious. Um, I first saw Insidious when it came out in the theater. They really promoted this one as being from the creators of Paranormal Activity. Um, I believe the paranormal activity film. And as you can see, just this is my nice little lenticular Nova media release. It's a still book release, but just, this is another one that has a kid in it that um, in a haunted house with ghost. And I I think this is one of the movies that you haven't seen before. So I'm not sure how much of this, you know, but, but at, um, shortly after moving, this family discovers there's some dark spirits um, in their midst. And they think from moving from one house to another house that those spirits would have gone away, that they were attached to the house. But the spirits were actually attached to that family. And so during this film, we get to see how that plays out. Um, this young boy that's usually in all the promotional material Um is part of that story and um this family has to kind of go through a dark journey to figure out where this boy has gone mentally because he's almost like in a coma state and throughout this whole um story there's darkness there's a demon looking creature there's um other spirits in this house So anyway, it's just a really good haunting type story. And there's a whole series of other Insidious. I think there's, I want to say there's at least two more Insidious films. I can't remember. There may be three more. But this series kind of all just ties together. And it's just a really good ghost story type film. Yeah, I was about to say it it spawned a couple of sequels. So Yeah, and you know, the sequels Uh, are usually not as good as the original. mm -hmm. They're not. But they all, but being that they all tie together, it makes it more of an interesting story. I, I could imagine it's good because um, I think it was James Wan who created yes. the Saw franchise, yep. who also did this one. And Saw is amazing, especially I, I'm a fan of the first one, mm-hmm. and it kind of goes up, up and down from there. But I, I could see if he had the creativity to. Uh, come up with something like Saw, what mm. he could have done with uh, this series as well. Oh yeah, it's really good, very very well done. It's it's one of those modern, like when I say modern day horror. There's a lot of jump scares, a lot of makeup effects, and to me, that's what brings the horror element to this film. It's just the unknown, not knowing what's going to happen next. Even if you were to rewatch this film, you know, a lot of those kind of films don't have very good rewatchability. But to me, um, with it being a part of a small universe of films, it's always good to revisit that whole story. And even going back to the original, it's always fun to see what happens. You know, you may not remember every little detail of it, so it's always good to go back to it. Despite what you just said, I'm still going to check it out because uh, one of the things I hate about today's horror movies is the the need for continuous jump scares. It's, It's fun when it's properly placed or every once in a while right. like over the weekend i i saw the nightmare on elm street marathon all the freddy films from the first one to freddy versus jason and you almost get to the point that you know <laughs> if they turn a corner or if they're walking backwards boom you're gonna run into somebody if, if not freddy someone else but it's almost a, a trope in today's horror movies that they feel the only way we could scare you is through a jump scare. And it's almost like films have become too reliant on that. Yeah. And and I think, I I guess some jump scares are really make it a fun theater experience, but Mm -hmm. if you got a weak heart 
or if you're a little older, you know, sometimes those cats screeching out in the darkness or, or, or something happening in the, you know, just a sudden movement could give somebody a heart attack. So, yeah, <laughs> but, they're, but they're fun sometimes, sometimes yeah. definitely unnecessary. And what's your fifth one? Okay. My fifth one is an older one. Um, big fan of this film. And that is an American werewolf in London. Um, this is one that I grew up watching and Arrow got a really nice 4k box set release. Of course, I've got the Blu-ray box set release that they did prior to this. I've got it's exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, I've got two different slipcover editions of it. I mean, it's just one of my favorite werewolf films of all time. To me, it's one of the best. Uh, I believe it's a John Landis film. Um, if you think about, if you've seen the um, Michael Jackson video for Thriller back in the 80s when it came out, it was a big deal how they did the transformation scene from the from Michael Jackson to the werewolf. And yep. this is where this all came from. Um, and I don't know, I just love it. I love the story. It's about two guys from the USA who have traveled to um, London. And while they're there... One of these, one of the two guys gets killed, and the other guy gets bit by a wolf, and of course becomes a werewolf. But the way that they do this, you know, you think about the Lon Chaney werewolf movies from the old Hollywood um, Universal films. The way that they did this werewolf is just so painful looking for the transformation from human to werewolf, and they really played it out very well. Um, you know, when I think about this movie, I think about the beginning of the movie the, with the pub scene and the community there in London where all this transpires. I always think about the transformation scene. And that's pretty much all I ever think about. It's, it seems like a very <laughs> simple story. There's not really much that goes on other than these two guys traveling and then the werewolf. And to me, I think that's a really good, simple horror story. It's it's not really terrifying. I guess the, the terrifying part of it is the fact that the transformation from man to werewolf looks so painful. It's like, who would ever want to go through any of that? Um, you think about the classic Hollywood um, universal monster film for the werewolf and how the guy's sitting in a chair and just the fur just kind of starts filling up his face and stuff. It doesn't look painful at all. But when you see the transformation yeah. from this particular um, werewolf, Nobody would want to ever get bit by a, were by a wolf, I guess. Um, but yeah. it's pretty terrifying. Yeah, and you're right. It, watching the, the making of Thriller on VHS back oh, in the yeah. day, um, I think that I saw that before I saw An American Werewolf in mm -hmm. London. So when I finally got to see the film, I was like, oh, this mm -hmm. is where they got that concept from. And the makeup and the special effects. Right. And this is terrifying yes. because it they made it seem like you are actually watching someone go through this. It wasn't like a claymation type right. of transformation like we may have seen in the past. Yeah, very it realistic. looked like his nails were growing, his hair yeah. was growing, his back yeah. was curling. Yeah, the bones were cracking. The mm. The teeth were just pushing, protruding out of his mouth. Man, it's pretty bad. Yeah. I And talking to Ryan recently, I think when we think of practical effects mm -hmm. from like the 70s, 80s, even the early 90s before computer-generated stuff was uh, becoming prominent, certain movies become classics, not just because of their use, but because it was so well done that it's memorable that somebody could pick up that arrow uh title today never seen it before and can appreciate the the beauty of yeah. what it took to make those uh practical effects look so real yeah there's you know there's a lot of films that i don't like so much but after watching what they went through to make that film it does give me a better appreciation you know I, you know you watch a film and you think oh i don't really care if i ever see this again and you kind of want to say I'm just gonna put that in the cell pile. But then you watch the the features afterward, the special features on it, and the trouble they went through to get the movie made, 
um, all the special effects that happened, you know, it makes you appreciate the film more, it makes me want to keep it in the collection even longer, you know. Mm-hmm. It's amazing what same. they've done in the past for these practical effects. Yeah, same thing with commentary sometimes. Okay. I, I listen to our commentary, uh, you know, let's say a director or a writer or whatever, and you hear the trouble that they went through or what they actually had to do to make a certain scene. Right. And it, it could elevate your enjoyment of that scene or the whole movie mm-hmm. overall because before that you're like, eh, yeah. no big deal. But then when you see the pain stake that they went through to actually get that done, you're like, oh, no, that's good. Right. I like that. Yeah. And this movie, I mean, y- you would think that it was a low-budget movie. Oh, yeah. And But they had a... I would say at the time, even then, a big time director doing it, uh, he he grew in infamy after that and after Thriller, of course. But, you know, it it was just a peculiar film at the time to come out and, you know, having it be in London versus just making an American horror movie. Mm. And there's a little bit of dark comedy to it, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially with the the ghost, the the first friend, the way he appears and different things, and like mm-hmm. you said, you know, you you use the word low budget. Um, I could see where you would think that it was low budget because you know, like I said, not very much happened in the movie. It was pretty simple. Um, you could see where they spent the budget. They spent the budget on those special effects, oh, but yeah. it, it's what made the movie. It's what made Everybody loved the movie, so very, very well done. Uh, here's a so, uh, question I'm sure you've never gotten before. How large is your collection currently? Yeah, um, you know, everybody always wants the numbers, the numbers, the numbers. I do not. Yeah, know. why? <laughs> I do. I go by the numbers that are listed on, because I do track every single title. is listed on Blu-ray.com, and I also have um, a database that I use. And I would always have to look at those numbers from their website. But to me, I don't know that it's 100% accurate because I think it goes by the disc that are in the sets because the mm. number seems very inflated. But there are thousands of movies on the shelves. And this is just one room. I do have another room over here that has just as much in that room. And I've got totes and totes and totes of stuff I, I like to keep my room organized and clean we so could tell i got all my stuff in totes that are not on the shelves um so i couldn't tell you how many how much i but there are thousands just trust me that's a good way to put it i've i've seen people try to estimate and yeah. the, the most shocking thing is that I, I can't remember what live stream you're on i, I think it was like one with uh tim from tim talks talkies and you said that people actually try to figure out your monthly budget yeah. based on the things that you buy. Yeah, I'm sorry, mind yeah, your own business. It's crazy. Do you know I mind do a monthly business. video? I do a monthly video, like um, of what I added to the collection during that month. And people got their calculators down. They're just trying to figure out how much I spent, and they are not shy to tell me, "Hey, you spent too much money." Saying, "Okay." Um, I didn't know that you went to work every day at 6 a.m. and didn't get off work until like 5 p.m. every single day. Mm-mm. Spent my money. Mind your business, people. Right. That is none of your concern. Be yeah. happy the man is sharing his collection with you and he's showing you what he picked up because other than that, it's none of your business. Right. None of your business. Yeah. Number three, name a classic horror movie that everyone loves, but for some reason or another, you can't stand. Oh, how about this? I don't know if you call it horror, but it's got horror in the title. The um, Rocky Horror Picture Show. That movie. People love it. It's a cult classic. I cannot Mm. stand. I cannot stand that movie. I don't like the music. I don't like anything about it. I tried to watch it. I almost turned it off, but I ended up finishing the film. But that's one of the films I do not like, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. That's probably going to be my choice because there's a lot of horror films that I 
I, I can't really think of many horror films that I do not like, but that would be one of them. Would you consider that horror? It's got horror in the title. It has it has horror elements, and yeah. it's funny because I was just telling Michelle from Mary Media the other day mm-hmm. that. I've never seen that. Oh, I've I've lived close to movie theaters that would show it every Saturday night at midnight, and people do the yeah. whole dressing up oh, and man. call you a virgin if you've never seen it, and yeah. they get up on the stage and do all the songs and all that. I've never seen it. I've yeah. never been interested in seeing it, and yeah. I like musicals, it's but a, it's a cult classic, that's for sure. But it's just not my type of film. Um, number four, name a critically hated horror movie, and there's plenty of them, but one that you love. Oh, well, critically hated. So, recently I was on a live stream and learned that there are quite a few people that hate the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. They can't stand the actors, they can't stand the story, the poor, the poor acting. And that to me, like I said at the beginning of the video, it's one of my favorite all time classics. I just love the story, the acting, you know, you, you base the acting on the time period that is, this was done in. It was very low budget back then, but to me, it's a really creepy film. The original Texas Chainsaw Massacre film will always be one of my favorites. And I know that I, I think you either love it or you hate it. And, and I love it. Now I have a confession to make. Okay. Uh, until this year, I've never seen that movie before. Right. I thought I heard that. And so you, I think oh, it was when the steel, the Blu-ray Steelbook came out. That's when I finally um, purchased it. Jeff from Films at Home suggested it, yeah, and I purchased it. it. Hmm? What did you think about it? Did you? I, for did one, you... I hated all. I hated all the characters oh, okay. um, in the van. Yes. I hated them all. <laughs> you were glad <laughs> and, to see most of them die then, right? Yes, I was. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I you, was. You and Tim from Tim Talks Talkies are on the mm-hmm. same boat. But I I had to continue to think about it, and I had to think about the time, because mm-hmm. the one thing that always upsets me is like when I hear people say things like, oh, I don't watch black and white films, or I didn't like this film because... Um, That wouldn't happen, or it looked terrible, the special effects look terrible. Well, you're used to, you know, computer-generated graphics from today, and, you know, your phone fits in your pocket. It wasn't attached to a bench with with a cord or whatever. So you really have to take film, like any other art, with the time in which it was produced. Mm -hmm. And trying to think back early 70s, -hmm. that must have been terrifying for people to see on the screen. Just oh, really? like an exorcist, just like a Jaws. It was a terrifying experience. And then to relate it all to something that really happened mm-hmm. made it even more terrifying. Yeah. I think, I think, um, in it being so low budget, but to me, just the, the house, the way that the house looked, um, the animals on the inside of the house, the chickens, the actual kills in the movie were just horrifying. And especially to think that this was all based on a true story, another reason why it makes it more horrific. But I can definitely see why some people would get aggravated about different parts of the movie, you know. But yeah, to me, classic. Finally, number five. Who would you like to see me have a conversation with on this channel? And I know it's not going to be Tony from Basement Blues, which mm-hmm. is a popular answer. Yeah. So, and you've who had you'd some- like to see? So you've already had so many people on here, but um, you've never had um, Stephanie Movie Chatter on your channel before, have you? I don't no, think I have not. Stephanie. Stephanie is a really big horror film watcher. I know that you may not get to speak with her during the horror, you know, during the Halloween season. But to me, I think she'd be a really great addition to your channel um, to have an interview with. She's really, she really knows her film. She loves films, and I think she'd be really a really good one to talk to. So Stephanie yeah. from Movie Chatter. Stay tuned. That's all I will say. I'll Stay tuned. Uh, and uh, as far as we're concerned, that's it, man. Yeah. I want to thank you for joining me today. Um, tell the people where they could find you. So I'm Tony, um, Basement Blues. I love collecting films. Um, I love talking about movies. I do watch at least one movie a day. 
this month of October, I'm doing 31 days of horror. So you can find at least one video every single day on my channel during the month of October, horror related. I'm doing some unboxings, um, doing some top tens, doing some recommendation videos, some of the worst horror films that I have in my collection. So definitely check that out. You can also find me over on Instagram. And occasionally I get on TikTok and talk about films on TikTok, but it's not my favorite platform. But anyways, I really appreciate the time that you let me have here, um, KB. This has been a lot of fun.